Hello, I'm Dr. Lark Wong, and I direct the Office of Behavioral Health Equity in the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And on behalf of SAMHSA and our Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, we would like to welcome you to this session one of the Data Story Telling webinar series. Um, this four part series is one of the events in our Elevate Community Based Organizations, or CBOs, our Elevate CBOs initiative. This strategic initiative is a policy driven effort of the Office of Behavioral Health Equity. The objectives of this initiative are to build capacity, increase visibility, and highlight the unique role of CBOs in addressing behavioral health issues, particularly in under-resourced communities. This initiative engages four strategies, education, partnership, technical assistance, and equity dialogues. While we understand that CBOs play an important role when serving their respective communities, we often hear from them that they lack consistent funding sources to allow them to sustain their services due to the lack of infrastructure and capacity. To fill this gap, the Elevate CBOs initiative provides trainings, webinars, and cash awards to CBOs to build capacity, convey their impact, and continue to advance their work. In today's first session of this series, you will learn from our speaker, Carlos Morales, about the overview of this series, the purpose and the strategies of data storytelling. Not only will he share different examples of data storytelling efforts, you will also see how he used the data from all of you uh, when you registered for the workshop to customize the content based on audience's background, interests, and knowledge. After the workshop today, Mr. Morales also plans to share some practical tools with you. We hope these tools will be helpful to you and your organization to tell your data-supported story. Um, while attendees, while you all can attend separate webinars, I do encourage you to join all four sessions to receive the maximum benefits. In addition to the workshop and tools, we also heard from many participants that they want FaceTime to meet with the speaker. So in response to this, we are also offering a post-workshop question and answer hour where participants can ask advice and tips regarding data storytelling from Carlos after each session of each workshop. Um, so let's see, uh, the data post workshop Q and A hour for this session will be held within the next two weeks. Um, space will be limited to post workshop Q and A hours. So stay tuned um, on how you can register during this workshop for the post workshop kind of often office hours Q and A. Um, so once again, I do wanna thank you very much for taking the time to attend today's session. I also want to acknowledge um, again, um, the Achieving uh, Behavioral Health Equity uh, team that we have in place from Apt Associates and Change Matrix uh, to help us in terms of providing um, this particular series. And most importantly, I also want to recognize Perry Chan, a senior staff in the Office of Behavioral Health Equity who leads our work and elevates CBOs. And he really brings a deep knowledge of community-based organizations, a dedicated, thoughtful, creative champion and advocate for community-based organizations um, who continually advances equity issues and opportunities for community-based or organizations, especially those serving under-resourced communities. So a lot takes a lot of uh, people to put uh, series like as this together. So I really want to thank all of you for the hard work you've done on this. Um, so now I want to turn um, the floor over to Carlos um, to begin the presentation for today. Carlos? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Thank yes. you to actually put that in there. Okay. Awesome. 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 Good afternoon. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, 
I'm going to start by saying that this is a four part workshop series on data storytelling for community based organizations. Throughout this series, we will discuss the power of data in telling your organization's story, digital marketing, and conveying impact to stakeholders. We're going to be offering some uh, limited capacity post workshop QA sessions after each session. So, Registration for the first post workshop Q&A will be added to the chat during this webinar. So please sign up if you have additional questions, all right? Also, make sure that if you haven't registered for workshop sessions two, three, and four, also in the chat, we just provided the link here. Feel free to actually do that as well, all right? Okay, so I'm going to be sharing my screen here, making sure that we got everything. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> One thing that I like to do, team, as I'm sharing my screen, uh, because I'm actually going to be showing some videos, I want to make sure that it's optimized for sharing the sound as well. So I'm unable to do that and check that uh, when I actually share my screen. So I just wanted to let you let the team know. All right, so let's uh, start by sharing my screen. So right now, you've probably seen the um, screen here for the uh, data storytelling, uh, and this is obviously the page, the net site, right? But I'm going to start by actually <clears throat> talking a little bit, just give you some actually just very short background in regards to who I am, okay? So one of the thing is, is that I provide training uh, and consulting to community-based organizations across the country when it comes to marketing, communication, and branding. I've been doing this since actually 2011. Um, and so... Um, and so one of the things that I do is actually I work with these community-based organizations and we actually create a lot of strategy, marketing strategy plans and communication plans and, and branding, uh, branding guys as well. So my role throughout this series is actually talk to you about data storytelling, all right? And what we're going to be covering today basically is we've done some welcome and introduction, but what we're going to be covering today is actually I'm going to start by talking about your data your story. When you register for this workshop, you actually answer some questions, right? And so you provided some data to us. So my my um, my role for that particular section of this workshop is I'm going to try to tell a story based on the data that you provided to us. And I'm going to I'm going to show you that in a few seconds. Then we're going to go into understating data storytelling. So this is more about what are the components? What are the things, what are the factors that you need to take into consideration when you want to tell your story using the data that you actually have collected, right? Then after that, we're going to be talking about the audience, which is very important. Who you telling the story to actually makes a huge difference in knowing that because obviously your audience is going to dictate how you want to present your story and the type of data that you need to present to them. Then we'll talk about ethics and equity in data storytelling. This is important because we're going to talk about ethics and equity when you are collecting data, when you're analyzing data, and when you are presenting data. In fact, um, uh, we created a guide for you that I think can be very beneficial when you are starting to actually go into your data and st storytelling uh, journey, when you're trying to put everything together. Then we'll go into, okay, how do we actually then create powerful narratives? How do we start actually writing the story? And we'll talk about the different elements that a story needs to have. We'll have some closing remarks and next steps uh, and some Q&A. Now, throughout this workshop, feel free also, as we said earlier, to use that Q&A um, you know, uh, button uh, uh, for you to actually ask questions. But at the same time, I'm gonna be asking you questions too and feel free to use the chat box to respond to me. Um, and as I'm actually want to engage with you in this in this workshop. All right, so let's start. One of the questions that we asked you when you actually register for this workshop is who you work with. You know, what are the populations that you serve, the communities that you actually provide services to? And you provided this answer, right? 
a lot of you, and here, and here's me actually trying to tell a story based on what I'm actually seeing, all right? So I'm seeing this actually chart right here, and I'm saying, well, based on this, a lot of you actually provide services to the African-American or Black community, right? All the way to, you know, we, you, you work with people with disabilities, uh, transition aid youth, the American India or Alaska Native, all the way to immigrants and refugees, right? So obviously, we have a very diverse group of CBOs attending this workshop. Now, this is me just telling you what I see here, right? But can I do better though? Can I actually tell a story based on the data that I'm actually seeing here? If I want to present this to an audience like you and sort of actually start triggering some emotion, I have to narrate it in a way that is actually more relatable to you right? Or talks more about why the population that you serve is very important when it comes to providing services in your community. So one way of saying this is, you know, our commitment to serving a broad spectrum of communities is evident in the diversity of populations our CBOs reach. From serving individuals experiencing homelessness to providing specialized care for African-American or Black communities and extending support to immigrants or refugees, among others, this chart not only showcases our dedication to equity, but also the complex needs of the populations we serve, emphasizing the importance of tailored behavioral health interventions. Now, that, it's a lot better than what I just told you a few seconds ago. So when we're talking about narrative, there's a lot of emotions actually that happens as you read in this. So if I want to tell a story about the population that you serve, I want to think about what is the best way for me to actually tell it in a way that is actually engages the audience, right? So any thoughts in regards to this narrative versus what I just told you a few seconds ago? What are your thoughts in regards to that? Because I'm not making any stuff up. I'm actually describing here what I believe is evident by the organizations that are here and actually are providing services to the different, different communities. But notice how I'm actually highlighting though that diversity of population that you actually reach, I'm highlighting too the dedication to equity, notice how actually I'm actually highlighting different elements here in your narrative in order for me to tell your story, right? And so I'm seeing here that some of the comments here, I think the narrative increases the connections overall, makes the data meaningful. I like the narrative, very insightful, emphasizes mission and purpose. Awesome, great. I'm glad that you're actually uh, thinking that this narrative actually makes a huge difference in the way that we present our data. Now, so can we actually shorten this? Of course, this is actually just me thinking about how can I tell the story, right? There are many ways that you can describe this. You can actually make it shorter, equally impactful, of course. But the point that I wanted to make is when we are talking about data, it makes a huge step, a difference how you present it, all right? Okay, let's actually give you another example here. Look at the areas that you actually, the services that you provide, the, the, uh, the, the areas of focus when it comes to uh, the CBOs attending this workshop and the service that you provide in the community, right? Now, obviously we have community-based organizations here that actually provide services, mental health, substance abuse, public health, um, all the way to child welfare, right? And so, if I'm reading this, I can say, well, I can see that a lot of you actually provide, a, you know, provide a variety of services to your community, and that's because your community is very diverse. Therefore, there's a lot of issues that you actually are want to be involved with, involved with and help your community overcome. Now, that's one way of narrating this. But on the other hand, though, if you want to actually use a narrative, it's another way of actually saying it, right? This chart reveals a wide range of interventions from mental health and substance use all the way to family support and child welfare. 
Now, that diversity and focus area highlights the comprehensive approach CBOs are taking to address the multifaceted nature of behavioral health challenges. It is a testament to our adaptability and commitment to addressing the needs of our communities holistically. Notice how now I'm actually highlighting the data in a different way, right? So I want you to start thinking as we are continuing the conversation here, I want you to start thinking about different ways of you presenting your data based on the audience that you wanna tell the story to. And of course, we're gonna talk about what are the elements that you wanna take into consideration later on during the workshop, but I just wanted to actually start with this based on the, on this, on the data that you actually have provided to us. Now, experience in, in, da in data storytelling. A lot of you, most of you are actually are at the beginner level and you're coming here to learn, right? Then we have some of you that actually are in the intermediate level. So you, you know, every once in a while you have actually used data storytelling. Um, you also, there's actually a few of you who have no experience whatsoever. That's totally fine. And there's actually a few of you who actually are very advanced, who probably have been able to create some very cool, you know, video images, infographics. You've done some great data visualization, be able to actually tell impacting and engaging stories, right? So we ha have a very diverse group of uh, organizations attending this. Now, I can actually describe this in a way that, well, many of us are at the beginning of a journey when it comes to data storytelling, right? With a significant portion identifying as beginners. However, though, there's a growing interest in harnessing data more effectively. Now, this trend towards embracing data storytelling is crucial for what? Well, amplifying our impact, securing funding, and advocating for policy changes. This actually highlights the need for capacity building in this area to empower organizations further. That's another way of me presenting this particular piece of data, all right? So I'm gonna actually now go here a little bit and talk a little bit about the challenges. What were some of the challenges that you actually are experiencing right now in data storytelling? If I wanna tell the story, you know, I can say, well, this graphic shows the most common problem we face, which is translating data into narratives that resonate. Presenting this information in ways that captivate and inform, pinpointing the most pertinent data and interpreting it accurately. Basically, I'm actually, when I'm talking about pinpointing the most pertinent data and interpreting it accurately, I'm actually highlighting all the different challenges in here that you actually have included here in this survey question. So what is this about? Refining our craft, meaning that as we start telling the stories, we actually start getting better at it. It doesn't mean that at the first time you actually start telling your story based on the data that you have, you're gonna actually have something that's gonna be impactful. You get better by you actually implementing and practicing some of the elements that we're gonna be discussing today. The, the whole idea is simplifying the complex and to tell stories that not only inform, but also inspire and drive change within the communities that we serve, right? So this is another way of me telling you about the challenges that you actually are experiencing right now when it comes to data storytelling that our goal is to help you and provide the resources, the information to minimize and or, or overcome those challenges, right? Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about this one. Interested in sharing examples. One of the questions that we asked is, how many of you would be interested in actually sharing examples of data storytelling? Notice that a lot of you actually said no. And that actually makes sense because if I'm looking at the data, a lot of you are at the beginner level, right? So you might not feel comfortable doing this, because you might, you might feel that you don't have nothing to show. However, there are a few of you who are, at the, who are at the intermediate level or advanced level, and you feel comfortable in sharing some of the examples that you have done in the past. So this actually data makes a lot of sense, right? So having said that, you know, this is another way that actually I can describe this. The interest in sharing examples of data storytelling among our peers reveals a community eager to learn from each other and collaborate. Notice I'm highlighting the collaboration piece here, right? 
This willingness to share success stories and lessons learned is the foundation of a learning community that grows stronger and more impactful together. Notice how, you know, obviously there is a lot of you who says I'm not interested, but then I'm also highlighting those that actually say yes. And the power of that yes, when it comes to actually showcasing your data story and selling examples, your lessons learned, and how everybody else will benefit from that. So this is another way, not only telling the story a little bit different, but also actually highlighting the positive on it, okay? And so this is, you know, so when we're talking about data, I just wanted to start thinking about how is the, what is the best way for us to actually present it, right? So let me actually give you another example here. We're gonna be talking about, let's, for this example, we're talking about school-based mental health programs, right? And I'm gonna start with this data. Let's suppose that I'm actually, again, I'm doing a presentation to you. I'm talking about school-based mental health programs. And I start with this. Our survey shows a 15% 15 participation rate in school-based mental health programs among students in 2023 compared to 10% in 2022. I actually go ahead and just say that. And I don't say anything else. I want to sort of actually weigh what kind of reaction I get, right? So I'm actually narrating, presenting this data to you this way. What are, what are the thoughts coming to your mind by me just saying it this way? What kind of, a, you know, what perceptions, what is, what is it that you gather for me saying, a survey shows a 15% participation rate in school-based mental health programs among students in 2023, compared to 10% in 2022. Okay, so there's a lot of here. Uh, <laughs> and they're coming really fast. So I'm trying to read some of them. Um, feels impersonal. I don't know what that means. That's right. If it's, Yes, it's an increase, but it seems low to begin with. No emotion. My thoughts, where is the data, the data coming from? Um, need more details. Need more context. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so there's a lot of here. It's it's an increase, but not too much. Yes, it's an increase, but not too much. So, how do I tell the story that I still don't, even though it might not be too much for some of you, but it's actually an important step in improving, right? So this is great because you're telling me what you think is wrong with this statement, and by you telling me that. I might want to use that to sort of actually then create a narrative that actually touches to some of those negatives that you actually highlight highlighted right now, right? Okay, so let me actually now give you a different narrative here. Because by looking at this data, so this presentation, for example, lacks depth. It's just numbers, right? Without providing any insights. Uh, it does engage your the audience, in this case, you. Uh, there's no storytelling element to make the data meaningful or actionable, right? So let's say if I actually then do this. <clears throat> what about this version of it? Imagine a school where every student knows they're not alone in the struggles, where reaching out for help is met with open arms and understanding hearts. That's the vision we're turning into reality as evidenced by the hardened increase in our mental health program participation from 10 to 15% in just one year. This is just, this isn't just a number, it's a symbol of hope. I cannot manipulate the data. The data tells me there's only been increased from 10 to 15%. All right, but how do I still actually give that importance of that increase? How can I actually make it compelling? How can I actually make it important, significant, right? Based on the audience that we're working with, when in this case, we're talking, we're working with the students. So if we actually give that framework or the way that we're narrating this, obviously we'll tell in the story here. And therefore, all of a sudden, your understanding of the data changes based on this narrative. So, and I, I'm, I'm trying to read here what you actually are, are putting in the chat. So what are, what, are your, what are your thoughts? Comparing narrative option one, to narrative option two. Does narrative option two, even though 
you mentioned some of you mentioned going from 10 to 15 percent in one year was was not a lot but look what the narrative option option number two does though it does give it in, in, importance to it right so that's the whole idea when actually we're talking about doing data storytelling so a lot of you saying yeah Number two, option two is more more impactful. There's a relatable change. Okay, great. So in this case, you know, when we're talking about, you know, providing clear context, right? And incorporating real life impacts, e transform abstract numbers into stories of change and growth. And that's what we're doing here. All right. So let me ask you, in terms of the emotions, what emotions or thoughts this narrative number two evoke compared to the simple data presentation of option number one? What were the thoughts and emotion that actually evoked from you? Hope, yeah? Change is possible, doable, hope again, imagine, Hope again, yes, optimistic, accepting of our youth, good intentions, making a difference. You're showing success, yes. You're showing improvement, you're showing growth. Show progress and intention, improving lives. Look at all the emotions that narrative option number two actually just created on you. What am I telling you? That when you are creating narrative, you gotta actually speak to the heart as well as to the mind. And we're gonna get into that a little bit, all right? All right, so having said that, all right, thank you for engaging with me and, and actually answering these this, this questions. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about then the foundations of data storytelling. Now, in this case, data storytelling is about communicating insights, data narrative and visuals that engage and inform an audience. We got that, we talked about it just a few minutes ago. We're talking about combining data visualization, right? Narrative and contextual analysis to make complex data, complex statistics accessible and actionable, right? Now, this diagram that you see here is nothing new. In fact, if you search in Google data storytelling, this, this diagram is gonna show up pretty much everywhere, okay? But the importance of this diagram though, it's important that we understand what that means. So this diagram actually shows the relationship between data, narrative, and visuals. Those three, those three elements have to actually play along together. They actually have to, um, when, when we're talking about data, story, data storytelling, you have to have those three elements. And narrative helps explain data. That's what you try to do, right? The visual help engage your audience. It helps remember the data. And the data provides the insight to convince the audience to do something about it. The data is pretty much the support that your narrative has. You're backing up your story with numbers, yeah? You're not making anything up. So when all those three elements, narrative, visuals, and data come together in a perfect balance, as you can see here, they help, I mean, they're bringing change in the form of you're changing perceptions, you're educating, you're engaging your audience, you can actually affect behavior change, you can actually have a process buy-in or a project buy-in from somebody, because obviously you are covering all those three elements. You're actually telling the story, my goodness, that is actually supported by data, but not only that, let me show you what this actually looks like. So you can remember, you can see the significance to it. Right. So now, how do we actually then, when we're talking about data storytelling, why this is important? Now, a lot of you, not if not all of you, you know that data storytelling is important. But why though? And the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because this is the things that actually we have to take into consideration when we're telling the story. Number one, we're talking about transforming complex data into understandable story. Right. It's about engaging our audience helping everyone understand the impact of the work that we do without needing to sort of actually decipher complex charts or statistics, right? That's the whole point of it. We want to simplify 
this process, right? Number two, we want actually our audience to do something with the story that we're telling, right? What's the action? Do we actually want to uh, uh, make some uh, policy changes? Do we want to actually uh, do some fundraising? Do we want the community to, to engage with us, have a conversation with us, have the community attend an event? I mean, what's the, what's the action that we want our audience to take based on the story that we're actually telling, right? And then what is that we do? We're highlighting success, but at the same time, identify an opportunity for improvement. Even, even data storytelling internally for a community-based organization can actually serve for us to kind of actually see the areas for growth within the organization. But not only that, what is it that you're doing when you actually are showing data? You're telling the story, you're showing visuals, you are promoting what? Transparency, accountability, and obviously you want to improve your results. That's what you're doing, right? So basically, as we're actually talking about data storytelling, I want you to remember this. I just mentioned this again. Good data stories start by listening to what the data says, weaving it into a narrative that speaks to the heart as much as it does to the mind, right? So we listen to what the data says, what the numbers are saying, right? But we gotta be able to create a story around it that actually speaks to the heart, you know, evoke the emotions that actually we just talked about in the examples that I provided, as well as it talking to the mind. There's a logic behind it, right? You gotta be able to rationalize the story, the data. And so it's important that we have all these elements in place. And I'm gonna show an example how to actually put this together. Now, talking about narrative, visualization, and context. Three key elements when we're talking about data storytelling. Narrative, the story. It's basically, this is where numbers transform into a journey, right? We're connecting the dots between data points, crafting a tale, telling a story that not only informs, but also engages. So, and when we're talking about engagement, everyone, it's not, it's, it's basically having our audience actually to take, to, to take action. That's what engagement is all about. Whether you want them to actually start a conversation with you, whether you want them to actually, uh, you're doing fundraising, whether you want, actually want to make some policy changes, whether you actually want to create awareness about a specific topic. Uh, it's about actually engaging the audience, making sure that the audience do something with the information that actually you're sharing with them. The visualization piece is actually very important as well, right? So we're talking about charts, graphs, whatever, maps, uh, you know, and we're using that as part of the story's illustration, that the role of visualization is actually making complex data instantly understandable and engaging. Because what happens is your audience don't see the numbers anymore. They actually, they see it beyond that. And they remember the data because of the way that you actually present it by doing some great visualization, whether it's a form of infographics, images, videos, some very cool charts, and we'll talk more about data visualization in session number two, all right? And then the context. You got The context is pretty much about the why. Why is the data this way? Why are the numbers increasing? No, you tell me the context behind it. What other factors actually are, contri are contributing to these numbers that you're presenting to me? It's actually, it's, it's, it's basically the backstory, right? So how do we actually put this into a practical way? So let me actually show you an example here for this particular uh, community-based organization. Now, this example, this organization, MindWell, does not exist, okay? I created this example for the purpose of this workshop because I want you to give you clear steps how to actually implement this. I wanted to make this practical. So when it comes to MindWell data storytelling example, Let's look at the narrative. Mindwell shares the story of Alex, right? A local high school student who struggled with anxiety and depression, but found it difficult to seek help due to stigma and a lack of accessible mental health resources, All right? So it's telling me the story here, right? Now, right there is telling me what the problem is. 
Now, this personal narrative is used to connect emotionally with the audience, right? It's making the issue relatable and highlighting the urgency of addressing mental health support in schools. Now, personally, if I'm actually listening to this story about Alex, personally, I can relate to that because I know people who actually have kids who actually are going through a similar situation, right? So right there, I can relate to that. And because I can relate to it, I start paying attention to the narrative, all right? So by you actually looking at the narrative for Minds Well, what are some of the emotions that actually is evoking from this narrative? What are some, 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 some of the things that actually come to your mind by me actually telling the story about Alex here? Okay, we have empathy, all right? Help, yes. Desire to help, compassion. Lack of access to mental health, yes. Urgency to help, all right. Concern. There's the other thing too that I want you to pay attention to. I'm telling, I'm telling the story of an individual. Notice how I'm actually humanizing the issue because I'm about to show you some data and I wanna actually put a human being behind it so I can relate it to you, okay? So, and so this is actually, is very important in terms of connecting with your audience, all right? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you now. So you're telling me the, you're telling me the story. Okay, show me the data that actually backed that up, all right? Again, this is just data that it was made up for this particular exercise. But in here, obviously, I'm showing you a data where it says that increasing rates of reported anxiety and depression among teenagers for the last five years, right? We can see that after 2020, the numbers went up, right? But I'm also showing another piece of data here that I'm telling you that in the area where Alex lives, only 30% of the school offering some sort of mental health support or mental health services, right? 70% of them do not. All right, let's go back again. Alex is struggling with anxiety and depression, all right? Obviously, it's, you know, it's finding it very difficult to seek help due to the stigma and lack of accessibility to mental health resources. Well, this data right here is telling me that yes, only 30% of schools actually offer helps in regards to mental health, right? Most of them don't. So right there is telling me there's a lack of resources, right? Okay, that's great. So the narrative, the data, but what's the context though? Why are these numbers big? Why are these numbers increasing, have been increasing for the last five years? What has been the cause? Give me the context behind it. Well, I can tell you here that when we're talking about the, con the, con the contextual analysis here, it's about setting that, you know, sets the scene for your data, showing why it matters. So in other words, we're actually giving the numbers, like we said, a backstory. So I'm telling you here, in this case, it's actually that, you know, MindWell is providing a contextual analysis discussing a broader trend that actually is contributing to mental health issues among teenagers, such as increase of social media use. Basically, as we see a lot of teenagers using social media, some of them actually have to do with bullying, other have to do with teenagers complaining with each other, thinking that somebody else's life is perfect, theirs is not. And so there's a lot of actually issues that actually increases anxiety and depression because of that. I'm sort of actually showing the context, right? Academic pressure, is another, is another reason why they, they, you know, anxiety and depression has gone up. They feel like they gotta be able to actually achieve this actually particular goal academically and might not feel supported in how to deal with that. Also, we have the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic that actually has contributed to that as a lot of actually adolescents started actually taking classes online, therefore, you know, lacking the one-on-one, the, the -on -one um, or, the, or, or lacking the support that they needed in, ter in terms of actually having relations with their friends. I mean, we can talk about 
what actually COVID-19 pandemic actually did when it came to mental health and anxiety. And I can provide additional data in regards to that, right? But not only that, not only that, I mean, we have an increase in the numbers of anxiety and depression because so there's a gap in mental health service provision within the communities, educational institutions, right? So this is actually the context that I'm giving you in regards to the data that MindWell actually uh, is presenting. And the reason why I gave you the context is actually to show you the significance of these numbers. So you start understanding why this matters and why we need to pay attention, all right? All right, so let me ask you this. What are your thoughts in this ex example in particular when it comes to actually presenting data when we're talking about narrative, visualization, and the contextual piece of it? Is this helpful? And actually trying to paint a picture on how to do this. <clears throat> Wanna actually, is this helpful? Yes, it makes it real. Yes, yes, yes. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Somebody actually asked, should this be done in this order? We're gonna talk a little bit about the order and I'm gonna give you a guide and I'm gonna give you some very cool good, uh, examples in regards to that. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, <clears throat> so, great. Thank you for the feedback, I appreciate it. Um, all right, so let me actually now go into this particular piece here. Now, when we're talking about data story, uh, data storytelling, these actually are the key components when we're talking about data storytelling, right? What is it that you need to do, number one? You, know, you need to have a clear objective, right? Every story should have a clear objective or purpose. Whether you want to inform, persuade, or inspire, it's important that you define what your goal is at the beginning. So if your objective is to convince stakeholders to invest in the expansion of your mental health services to minority youth, your data should actually focus on showcasing the positive impact that it can have on your community, right? So we start with an objective. Number two, relevant data. The data that you choose to include in your story should be relevant to your objective, right? And the whole purpose of it is we don't want to overwhelm your audience with excessive data, of data that actually doesn't support your goals. So we want to make sure that we select the ones that actually are going to help achieve that particular objective or goal that we have. So if we are want to focus on data that highlights service impact, then treatment outcomes, if we're talking about mental health, or community needs assessment to showcase areas of success, and identify gaps in the service provision makes sense, okay? So it's important that we actually, you know, pay attention to the type of data that we want to showcase, right? All right, let's talk about now data visualization. And the data visualization actually, it plays a very important role, right? So you gotta be able to choose whether you actually doing some charts, graph, infographics, videos, you gotta be able to choose the best um, data visualization that actually rep do a very good job in representing your numbers, your statistics. So the uh, whole idea here, if we want to make it easier for your audience to remember and to understand the information that you're providing. So for example, you can use a bar chart if you're showcasing the number of individuals seeking help for mental health monthly or comparing service usage rates across different age groups within a community. Notice how at the beginning, a lot of, I mean, all, all the information that I provided to you in terms of the data that you provided to us when you answered the survey was done via bar charts, right? Obviously, I could have actually done it using other type of uh, other type of charts. We'll talk more about charts in data visualization and the purpose of each one of them and when you want to actually select them. But what I'm saying is, when we're talking about data visualization, you got to be able to actually make sure that the way that you actually... Um, deliver in the way that you present the data, whether it's via images, videos, or, or, or charts, has to be obviously in a way that is actually engages your audience. And you gotta actually then think about who your audience is. Will they be able to understand what I'm actually presenting to them? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors that you wanna take into consideration. But for actually to, to simplify this, we talk about number one, clear the objective, the relevance of data, it's important, right? What type of data do you want to present? the type of uh, visuals 
that you're going to use to present that as well. And then we talk about engaging the narrative. A compelling story is not just about presenting numbers, but it should also include a narrative that also is about captivating your audience, right? Weave your data into a story that is rel relatable and impactful. That's what I try to do at the beginning of this workshop, when I actually started showcasing your responses, right? And the exercises that we have gone through. And then obviously we talked, we talked about contextual interpretation, which is basically showing me why the numbers matter. What's the backstory? Why this issue exists, right? By you actually telling me that it, it, you ex, you're explaining what are the trends, what are the parents, what are the correlations you have identified, and you're discussing their, you're discussing their implications. So the context in summary explains the why and how behind the numbers. Okay. All right. So now that we actually are clear in, ter in terms of the key elements when you actually are doing data storytelling, we got to talk about one of the most important piece of it, and that is your audience. All right. Now, I'm actually walking th through this, but I'm going to show you in a few minutes how you can put this together. Okay. So I'm gonna give you an example in how you can put everything together when you start actually crafting your, um, your data storytelling um, efforts, all right? So I know that obviously I'm going in a specific, in a specific direction and a specific order, but there's a reason why I'm doing that, all right? And I'll, sh and I'll showcase it to you in a few minutes. Now, this piece of it here, if you actually are telling a story, you gotta, you gotta think about who you're telling it to, right? So you have community members, obviously individuals who live in the area served by CBOs that might be directly affected by or interested in specific issues and initiatives, right? That's one of your audiences. Then you actually have stakeholders, partners, right? Whether local businesses, whether other healthcare providers that you partner to, you send referrals to. They actually play a role in supporting your efforts in the services that you provide, right? Then you have funders. How do I tell this story if I wanna actually raise more money? If I wanna expand my services? What's the data that I actually need to highlight and how do actually I tell the, the, the benefit of the services that we're providing so they can see the value, right? And obviously they feel compelled to give us money. Then we have policymakers. Officials, obviously, who influence laws and policies affecting behavioral health services and funding, right? And the general public, talking about which is a wider audience, audiences that actually, you know, goes beyond just the community that you serve. However, though, they can still be impacted by the service that you provide. So understanding who your audience is is key. They determine, I want to tell you this, they determine how you tell your story. If you have no idea who your audience is, doesn't matter what you do with the rest of the information, then your story is going to actually fall flat. Your audience determine how you're going to tell your story, how you're going to collect the data, how you're going to present it, all right? Because they're the one who you want them to actually take some action, right? All right. So why is this important? Well, by understanding your audience, obviously, you will be able to actually then craft a specific communication. A specific narratives, right? So for example, the stories for policymakers might emphasize evidence and outcomes, while for community narratives, you might want to focus on personal impact and testimonials. Two different audiences, two different stories, right? In terms of relevance, well, you highlight aspects of your data that actually directly align with your audience's priorities or challenges, making your story more compelling. Hence the example that I just gave you when it comes to policymakers or uh, you're trying to actually engage your community. And obviously, engagement. This is the action that you actually are searching for that you're going after. Understanding your audience helps in choosing the right platforms and formats for your story, whether it's presentations, social media posts, reports, or interactive web content. We're going to talk about social media quite, quite a bit in session number three. All right? So if that's one of the areas that you're interested in, make sure that you register for that as well. Notice how I'm actually making the plugins for all the different sessions as I go here uh, throughout this workshop. So uh, 
But anyway, so we'll talk quite a bit about uh, marketing on session number three here. So, but the whole idea in terms of understanding your audience is actually is one of the mo is most important elements that you have to consider, all right? So when it comes to understanding your audience, are there any other reasons why you think that's important? In the chat box, tell me why do you think it's important to understand your audience when you actually are crafting your story, telling your story? Any thought? If you think it's important, why do you think actually knowing your audience makes a huge difference? All right. You don't lose them information. They don't, yeah, language. They'll take action. Keep them interested. Get audience buy-in. Understanding the background and frame of reference. You want your efforts to be effective. Context. Yes. So you know this is important. All right. Okay. All right. So it's not only enough understanding who your audience is. You might want to. You actually want to make sure that you learn how to actually segment your audience. So if you consider an organization that is focused on, your, on youth mental health, the audience could be segmented into students, parents, educators, and healthcare professionals, each with unique roles and interest, right? If the goal is to tell the story about how you're making an impact on the service that you provided with mental health youth, you want to take into consideration who you want to tell the story to. Or if your goal is to actually then grow your mental health service and be to expand the service to other areas or to more youth, then who do you want to tell the story to? So you actually can get the funding in, able to, you know, in order for you to do that. So in other words, here's one thing that I'm going to ask you. How many of you actually have a database of audiences that you work with in different capacity. It can be a database with email addresses, obviously of people that communities, uh, community members of people that you actually provide services to, uh, uh, funders, partners. Okay, so some of them are you working on that and some of them actually, yes, I have a database. We do a spreadsheet. Okay, here's one thing that I wanna tell you. Oh, well, let me ask you this. How many of you actually communicate with that database on a regular basis? How many of you use that to tell stories? Yes, no, virtually we do. We do with a newsletter. Not yet, not yet, yes, monthly newsletter. I connect to Tableau to great, okay, yes. We send a newsletter. We export, I communicate to marketer programs. We'll, test, we'll tell stories in marketing, okay? All right, so for those of you that actually are connecting with your audience via newsletters, um, what type of results are you getting? Are you getting the results that you're looking for? I mean, what is it that you're looking for when actually you are crafting newsletters or telling your stories via emails, for example? What do you want your audience to do? Because you can actually have a database, you are sharing your newsletter, but at the end of the day, what do you want them to do? They're reading the information, some of them, right? So you look at, yes, open rate engagement, what do you want them to do? One of the things that, and we'll talk more about in session number two is, it's very important as you actually have, whether you actually have a database of different segments that you actually tailor your communication based on the segment that you actually are sending emails to. You might have a newsletter, but if you actually want to reach out parents and talk about youth mental health services, the way that you actually tell the story to parents is gonna be totally different by someone who actually is a possible funder. So the whole purpose of me asking you that question is, you might have a full database and you might actually send a newsletter, but do not send one message only to everybody. 
because then what you're not doing is you're not, you're not tailoring your communication based on the audience that you actually have in your email list, okay? So basically, when we actually are segmenting our audience, what's the reason why we do that? Because obviously, what we're doing is we're breaking it down into specific groups, right? Based on the roles, interests, and influence, and basically based on the objectives that we want to reach. We actually want to be able to understand the way that they communicate and their communication preference and interests. Hence the example that I just actually gave you. If I'm actually trying to talk about mental health for youth and I'm reaching out to parents, the way that I'm going to tell the story is going to be different if I'm actually uh, reaching to a you know, policymakers, for example, right? So therefore, we got to be able to tailor our communication specifically to the audience. So if you have a database and that you use on a regular basis, I would actually then urge you to start segmenting that and not send one newsletter to everybody, but start telling stories that are specific to your audience. And I, I can guarantee you, you will have a better success rate in regards to that in terms of the engagement level. Obviously, you define your objectives for each segment, right? And this is actually, if you wanna, you might wanna aim for students to engage more with mental health resources, where for, if you're talking to policymakers, the goal could be advocating for increased mental health funding. If I'm actually talking to youth, then I actually might wanna actually use some stories actually from social media. Or I want to incorporate social media into the communication because youth is my audience, right? I wanna use other youth to be part of the, story, the storytelling process as well. So there's the, that connection if I'm actually talking to youth. <laughs> Look how my approach is totally different based on the audience that I'm actually, I'm trying to engage with. So I'm gonna actually share a document really quick here. When it comes to actually sharing best practices when selecting data with ethical and equitable consideration based on the audience that you identify. Because this is one of the pieces that we wanted to make sure that we cover. Because it's not only about selecting the data, but how do we make sure that ethically and equitable, actually you know, the principles are applied when actually doing data storytelling. So let me actually just really quick here, show you this document. You're gonna have access to this because the resources are gonna be part of, um, you have access to the resources um, via the recordings as well. And so one of the things that I wanna make sure that you understand, and we're talking about ethics and credible data, storytelling and strategies, is that we wanted to remember, right? And we wanna consider the diversity of our audiences, right? So when we're talking about narrative, for example, and we're talking about empowerment in narratives, and we talk about the purpose of it, well, we wanna use data stories to give voice and power to those represented, not to just illustrate data points, but we also wanna highlight community strengths and positive outcomes, even when we're talking about challenges. So notice that if I'm actually telling you about the challenge and struggle of an individual, I also want to highlight the outcomes that you have been able to actually achieve via the service that you provided, right? So you just don't want to actually just present data in just a negative way. You present the issue, yes, but tell me what the possible the positive outcome can be if you have the, necess the necessary elements that you can implement. Or Tell me what actually has changed from last year to this year in terms of how your program has advanced or the success that you actually have achieved. Obviously, you have progressed, but you still need to keep moving forward. So remember the example that I gave you in which we talked about, you know, a year ago, we only had 10% of the youth actually taking advantage of the mental health services. A year after, it was 15%. Right, you actually read that statement by itself and you say, that's not a lot. But the way that we narrated the story, we empowered that narrative and we highlighted that growth, right? So the practice here that I want you to get into the habit is you wanna feature stories that highlight community strength, resilience, and positive outcomes. So how do you do that? Well, if the data shows a high rate of substance abuse in a community, also present stories of recovery and support systems. Keep it, keep it balanced, right? For instance, alongside a statistic, you can share a narrative of local support group success 
and help in helping individuals recover. This balances the narrative. So this is actually one of the things that you want to take into consideration. If we actually talk about informed consent and privacy, okay, yes, we got to respect everybody's autonomy to choosing whether the data is included in your narratives and personal details are anonymized, making sure that we informed the people that we actually are collecting data from about this particular, this particular practice, right? So if we're publishing a success story of someone's recovery journey, we got to obtain their explicit consent through clear and understandable consent form, right? And we got to make sure that we explain how their story is going to be used. If we want to ensure their anonymity, we can still, we can still tell their story, but we might, we might need to change their names or omit a specific data that might be able to identify them. This is important. So as you are actually going and looking at this guy, this is actually more of a checklist and some of the things that you need to actually apply when you actually are collecting data, present at the analyzing data, present the data. This is the other one, accuracy and factual integrity. This is important, right? Making sure that the data is reliable, incredible, that they, that they are verified, it's accurate information, you're not making any stuff up, it's being fact-checked as well. And so, and here's how, this is an example of how you can accomplish that. For example, if you wanna illustrate data of the effectiveness, you have a new mental health program, right? And you actually say, hey, this new mental health program has been very effective. Okay, compared to what? Show me a pre and post survey that measure participant mental health status before and after the program. So actually I can see the difference, right? You can actually say that you can collect this service calculate the average improvement, ensure these results, right? Be briefly describe how you collected this information and make sure there's any limitation in your survey. You wanna mention that, such as the number of people that you surveyed to give a full picture of your findings. By actually applying this, everyone, these methods provide a clear and easy to understand snapshot of your program's success. So I'm actually showing you here in terms of what's the purpose of this? What is the practice and how you actually can do it? Same here with bias recognition and fair representation, cultural sensitive and context, accessibility and comprehension, equity of impact, transparent accountability. So obviously I'm not gonna have time to go to each and every one of them, but I wanted to make sure that I wanted to highlight when it comes to ethics and we're talking about equitable data storytelling, What's the guy? What are some of the principles that we actually need to, need to take into consideration? And this is one that I actually want to make sure that you pay attention to. Now, how do I, now based on this, make sure that, and actually I'm going <clears> to, <throat> when it comes to, now, we talk about ethics here. Now let's actually talk a little bit about identifying your audience. So let me actually show you this document here, and this is actually a guide. In terms of identifying your audience, what are the different pieces that you need to consider, okay? What are the questions that you need to ask, right? So in this case, for example, look at audience identification, who are you trying to reach, demographics and characteristics, right? Identifying the subgroups, the segments that we talked about, what is the knowledge and literacy that they actually have about the topic, right? When it comes to data and visualization, are they familiar with the topic that you want to tell a story about? So what are the goals and expectations? What does your audience expect to gain from your story? Or what information do different audience segments want or need from your stories, right? You got to look at their motives, the, you know, why they're seeking information, the support, the actual insights. At the end of the day, what do you want them to do? Again, as I'm actually you looking at this, this will help you. If you answer these questions, it will help you to get very specific in terms of the audience that you want to tell the story to, okay? But only that, I added the elements of data and equity here and ethical and equity considerations is actually added in here. The elements that we just actually just talked about, all right? And how you apply this as you are creating and working on the audience that you actually are telling the story to. And finally, obviously here is actually, you gotta define what the objectives is. What change or action do you hope to inspire? The message development piece, okay. What is the message that actually is gonna resonate with the audience, right? What storytelling techniques I need to use? 
So look at, you know, this is the set of objects and telling the message, right? Now, how do I now actually put this, you know, how do I actually make sure that all of this information is actually applicable? I'm going to give you a case study in which I actually use all this information and created a narrative about an organization. Now, this one over here, actually making sure that I have the right information here. <clears throat> We're gonna be talking about <clears throat> all right. So this is actually Mindful Horizons is another organization that I created to actually give you an example in how you can actually create this. Now, this is about working and talking about identifying your audiences and telling the message based on the audience that you actually are working with. In this example, notice how here we are working with adolescents age 13 to 18. We also are targeting our teachers in middle and high schools, parents of adolescents, local mental health professionals and city council members. We have different audiences, right? So in this case, this is the adolescents that we're working with here, low income communities, LGBTQ plus youth, high academic achievers, those with a history of trauma. Now, for this example, obviously I'm actually segmenting into different audiences. In your case, might actually just be here for adolescents. You're talking about just high school students and that's perfectly fine. But the reason why I'm showing you this is because you can go as deep as you want to or as specific as you want to, right? And so these are the subgroups that we identify for this particular example. When it comes to the audience knowledge and literacy, actually we have adolescents. Well, they have a moderate to high social media literacy. So very mental health literacy as well. So we wanna make sure that if we're gonna communicate with, me, with them, we wanna think about social media as one of the ways that we wanna actually tell the story to, right? In here, high professional literacy when it comes to uh, mental health, right? Varying degrees of mental health programs knowledge, parents as well, diverse levels of health literacy and socioeconomic backgrounds requiring tailored messaging. When it comes to professionals, policymakers, this is the piece where we actually will get it more deeper. What's the audience knowledge and literacy when it comes to the data that we're about to present or the topic that we're gonna be telling, telling a story about, right? The audience goal and expectations, all right. For adolescents seeking mental health information, for teachers, they need classroom resources, student engagement strategies, for parents seeking understanding of mental health and how to support their kids. Notice how the goals and expectations are different, right? And then we go into the selecting data with ethical and equitable considerations and power and representation, and here how we do it. We select success stories from adolescents who access counseling through school programs. We want to highlight that. We also, we want to make sure that we actually show it, choosing data that show demographic breakdown of program participants to ensure fairness and representation. So notice how we're applying the principle of empowerment and representation by selecting the right data that will fall under this category, right? We go into informed consent and, uh, and privacy and so on. So all this, I wanted to show it to you, to you so you actually have a practical example in how you can apply this, right? And this is just basically about your audience, right? So I'm gonna stop right there and I wanna actually hear from you, what do you think so far of this particular case study and the document that I just showed you? I got a couple more case studies that I need to show you as well, but what are your thoughts in regards to that? Mm. Any thoughts on regards to this example? It's very detailed. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, there's a lot of information, but very helpful. The reason why I provided this detailed example, and you're gonna have access to other examples that I'm gonna, I'm not gonna have time to actually showcase. They're actually a lot smaller, and it might be, you know, it might be relevant to some of you if you actually don't want it to be as detailed as, as it is, right? All right, comprehensive, okay, cool. 
All right, so here's one thing because obviously we need to move along here and I'm gonna actually close this and I'm going to showcase here slideshow from this particular. Uh, okay, all right. So when we talked about, you know, storytelling, right? And now we actually going into crafting your narrative, right? I want to make sure that, you know, community-based organization and the business of storytelling, and that's the business that we're in. You're always telling stories about the services that you provide, right? You're always telling stories about the community that you serve. You know, where you're talking to family, friends, staff, you know, funders, partners, you always tell in stories about that impact that you make in the community, the service they're providing, the clients that you're working with. We're in the business of storytelling. In fact, we don't have to be a, you know, work for a, an organization in order for us to actually be in the business of storytelling. We all are storytellers, right? Just actually when you go home and somebody asks you, how, how was work? How was your day? You're still telling your story. So, yeah, some, things, some stories might be compelling, you know, versus others. But we always are in the process or in the in the habit of actually telling stories, right? So when we talked about you know powers that stories have, there are three things that I want to highlight here. The stories help understand and remember, and stories grab and maintain our attention, and the stories touch our emotion and engages, right? Now, the type of stories that you actually can tell are the origin story. Tell the story of why your organization exists. How did it come about? That's one type of story. Community story. You humanize your community, right? You're changing it. You sort of actually, you, you're telling about the people that you actually serve by showcasing a side of their lives that people might not know about. And this is when you actually are telling individual stories of somebody actually who has benefited from your services that you provide. Impact story. All about the changes that you have created. The outcomes, the progress, the growth, right? Behind the scenes story. And this is actually what happened in terms of, okay, you know, what is it that's happened? How actually this problem came about? What we had to do behind the scenes in order for us to actually provide this service, right? This is actually about highlighting the people that actually work with in the organization, your staff, volunteers, right? And then we have the user-generated story. And this is actually stories that I created by the community that you serve, the people that actually follow you and support you. And a lot of these stories, you actually can see it in social media. If you're posting something about a specific service or a story about someone and you start getting a lot of comments in regards to that, you're generating user-generated story. That's what that is, all right? And so when you actually, once that you actually, we know the different type of stories that you can actually can create, well, you gotta actually think about your story format. There are many ways that you actually can tell your story. We're gonna actually dive a little bit more in depth into this in session number three. But obviously you can use video, blog, newsletters, uh, photos, uh, podcasts, social media, multimedia, illustration. And so basically there are different ways that you actually can choose, your, you know, you can actually uh, present your story as well. So let me actually now present to you this video Certainly, it's 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 a two-minute video, but I think it's actually make a powerful point when it comes to about telling the story of an individual. It is called the power of one. I want to make sure though that you're able to actually listen to this. So let me make sure that I have um I want to play it and let me know, but I, I want to make sure that you are able to. Because I, I wasn't able to actually share. Let me actually just go back here. Let me know if you're able to uh, listen to it really well or not. Uh, I think you may have to stop sharing and then reshare checking the box that, that says. Yeah, I tried shared. to do that, but it didn't It didn't actually um, allow me to. Let me actually try to do this one more time here. Um, all right, I'm gonna actually show it one more time here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, yeah, it's not it's not letting me, to be honest with you, to actually optimize it for sound and video clips. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to um, to do this. Um, 
So I'm usually able to do that, but no, I don't have that um, capability. All right, so we're gonna move on um, and I'm not gonna be able to do this. Um, so let's actually now share my screen here really quick and then All right, so here's where we're talking about crafting your narrative. I mean, the video that I wanted to show you is actually was the power of actually sharing individual stories and why when you actually humanize the story by actually sharing the story of one individual, it's more, it's more powerful than actually talking about a whole group of people. And so people tend to relate more when you're telling the story of just one person rather than actually turning the story of hundreds of thousands. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight in this. So. When we're talking about crafting your narrative, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that you understand is obviously we got to define the message, right? We got to be clear in terms of what the message is going to be. Um, this is actually where we're talking about what is the issue at hand? What's the problem that you're solving? What is it that you wanted to highlight, right? And so our program has improved mental health outcomes in our community by 40%. That is an example of defining your core message. Number two, understanding your audience. We actually went through this. Here's an example. If your audience is local poly policymakers, you emphasize data and outcomes that highlight the need for policy support, right? It's structuring your story. Introduction, you set the stage with background information on the issue your, da your data addresses. The challenge, what is the problem or the challenge your community faces? The solution, obviously you gotta present a solution that data supported, right? And the impact. If I'm actually applying the solution, what's the impact? What are the results and improvements that we actually are getting based on these compelling data visualizations, right? And the call to action. What do you want your audience to do with that particular story? So obviously we gotta use emotional language and visuals, right? An example, use before and after images to show the impact of your services. Yes, alongside personal story from community members. We'll be talking about that for the last few, for the last few minutes. Obviously, if we're talking about incorporating storytelling elements, what's who is the story about? Who is the individual? Who's the character? What's the conflict and what's the resolution, right? And now, what are some of the ethical considerations that I need to consider that need to be part of the story as well? And the feedback and iteration, this part over here is one of the things that we actually recommend. You wanna share drafts with the team members or a subset of your audience for feedback, right? If you are actually telling the story of youth or a specific story of a, a, a story of specific youth, a specific individual, you want to share your draft with that person to for them to actually provide feedback, right? Making sure that you actually use that feedback to refine your narrative for clarity, impact, and, res and resonance. It's important. You might want to actually show them first and see, hey, what do you think of this? This is what we're hoping to achieve. Do you have any reservations, any concerns about this? And this is actually best practice when it comes to crafting your narrative in regards to that. So really quick, really quick, because obviously, um, you know, we had, we actually are running very, very uh, low on time. I want to actually to show you here some examples when it comes to actually drafting your story here. This is actually an example of an actual uh, organization. It's called the Battersea Animal Shelter. Look at the story that here that is very short and sweet story for a donor appeal that shows how much can be said with just a few lines of text combined with an emotional evocative picture. So what is it that I'm actually going after here, right? I want to raise money. I want people to donate. So obviously we have the main character here was this beautiful puppy here, right? And obviously we actually have a statement here. So it has a well-described main character, a struggle. Finally Noah found himself on doorstep at just eight months old, but with the help of supporters like you, we were able to find him a loving home. You are the solution, right? And so this is one example. Here's another one. Advocates for children of New Jersey. Tell a very clear and succinct story about why they do what they do in the first two sentences of their Who We Are section. They say children cannot vote. They have no political influence. They can tell our state leaders what they, what they need. That's why we're here. So this is the problem and this is the, we are the solution, right? It's another one. The Center for Nonprofit Management. It's another great example of a quick 
story here highlights the vision, the main character, which is our nonprofits, the problem, lack of resources, and their solution, which is connecting nonprofits with the resources that they need. And finally, I want to actually highlight this one. Look at this one, how actually they're using data here. And this is the Malala Fund and highlights their work by segmenting their catchment area in the unique challenges and solutions for each area, right? They provide compelling pictures and statistics that emphasize the text. So in here, this case, they want to actually, their focus is to spread awareness of the issue of education in Brazil during the pandemic and how their programming addresses the issue. So days since the school closed, 778. Number of girls impacted, 27 million. Current status is still close. Girls is out of school before COVID-19, about 2 million. Our priorities, look how they actually are telling the story via the numbers that they are providing. And here it says in Brazil, our strategy centers are monitoring state and national education budgets, establishing protocols for the safe school reopenings and addressing violence and abuse against girls. And they have a main character. So in other words, this is actually different ways where you can tell a story. Now, I did not have a chance to show you how these case studies that I actually created for you put all the elements together, but you have access to that as part of the resources for this particular workshop. Because at the end of the day, I want to present to you something that is practical, that you can have the guys, you can have the workshops, I mean, the worksheets that you actually can use to fill it out based on ones that are already filled out for you. But you have access to that, even though I didn't have a chance to show it to you. All right, so we'll stop right there because we actually needed some final Q&A and I wanna make sure that we still have uh, a few time, a few minutes for that. All right. What's going on team? Help me out here in terms of any Q and A's that we need to pay attention to. Um, all right, so I, I'm, I'm actually looking at the chat box here. It was great, thank you. Um, what a consultant are you cost to hire for a program? Whoa, thanks Jonathan, hit me up man, we can talk. Um, Everybody, um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to actually thank you for being here. There was a lot of information. I wanted to show you some real case studies, but you too, you have access to that. So what's the next step? If you have questions, I want you to go back to the to the website where you're going to have access to those. There's actually worksheets and case studies. And start drafting your data, uh, uh, your data narrative. If you have questions, come back next week for an hour and ask me questions. If there are things that you actually are stuck with, but I wanna make sure that we help you draft your narrative. So we, we'll move on into session number two in March for data visualization. And by the way, we might have a couple of, uh, of you being part of it because we wanna make sure that you showcase have you done data visualization, have you told your stories. So um, any final questions, comments, concerns that I have not been able to see? Let's see we here. We have a couple questions in Q&A. So here's one. Um... How would you approach an audience that is resistant to the data being presented? All right, so that's a great question. So one of the things that I would actually ask a follow-up question with that, why is are they resistant to the data that is being presented, right? I wanna know their concerns and I wanna make sure that I actually, I speak to their concerns. Look, a lot of the times when we have an audience that is very reluctant based on the data that we're presenting is because of a lack of communication or because we may not be able to do a very good job in explaining what this data is about, right? But at the same time, we wanna be able to actually showcase the benefits of showcasing these numbers to this particular audience, right? And so I wanna make sure that I wanna know more in order for me to address those concerns. Um, what is the, uh, uh, how can we access the resources that you presented today? Um, you're going to have access to those in the, um, Cheyenne, help me out here. They're going to have access to the recording and they're going to be able to access the resources there, correct? Yes, absolutely. And um, they have access and for the link for that particular, um, yes, site? Yes, it's in the chat. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Yep, I just saw it. Um, <clears throat> We have another question along the lines of the one that you just answered. Um, okay. How do you present data or narrative to a sensitive subject like child abuse? Sure. So basically, when it comes to actually sensitive subjects like that, the way or the way that I like to approach it is actually going work to the ethics and the equity portion section. I want to make sure because if it's a very is a very sensitive subject, I want to make sure that I'm actually when it comes to selecting the data and analyzing it. I'm actually doing it the right way, making sure that I'm. if I want to be able to tell the story and it's because it's very sensitive, I don't necessarily need to highlight a specific individual, but I still want to be able to tell what the issue is. And if I actually have, you know, the right, the right amount of representation, but at the same time, I want to highlight some successes based on the services that I'm providing as well. The thing is, when we have a topic that is very sensitive, we tend to actually lean towards presenting something that is really negative. But remember, we gotta actually keep the balance. When you actually balance that out and with you, yes, there is an issue, there is a problem, there's actually, there's a benefit based on these numbers and the services that we're providing too, you actually are converting that narrative from something that is negative into actually converting it to something that is hope. And so keeping that balance and making sure that you put into, into practice, the guidelines that we actually, uh, I explained to you when it comes to ethics and equitable um, data storytelling and strategies, I think is key because of the, na the nature of the, of the topic itself. Here's my suggestion to you. Based on what we actually covered today, grab the guys and go through the questions and start answering that when it comes to child abuse and see what you come up with and how you actually can frame this story based on the guys and the worksheet that we have provided. And let's see what you come up with. And you might be surprised in how you'll be able to present the story in a different way. <clears throat> let's see, what other questions do we have? Do we have more time to answer questions? Again, if we're not able to answer questions, you remember, we can actually still answer some of these questions next week. We're gonna meet for an hour. So register for that, for that uh, post Q and A. Any final thoughts, comments, concerns, anything that I have not be, uh, you know, um, you know, thoughts on your, on, on today's uh, um, workshop? Was it a yay, a no, it's so-so? I know I went through a lot. I apologize. Didn't have time to showcase some of the stuff that I wanted to. But again, you have access to all those resources. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you for saying yes. It was good. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, my goal was to actually give you something that you actually can implement. Hence, the guys and workshops that I created uh, and you have access to um, because I want you to Explain the concept, just grab it and apply it right away. No fluff, uh, just making sure that you actually come up with something that is tangible. That's the whole purpose of this workshop series. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Remember, register for the uh, Q&A post-workshop next week. Um, you'll be able to actually, as you register, probably be able to actually have some Put some of the questions that you want me to, to talk or answer. Thank you, uh, Austin, Wendy, Trevor. Um, thank you so much. Let's see here. Thank Anything you, else? Carlos. I'm sorry? Thank you, Carlos. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Like Carlos said, we'll be sharing the related resources in the recording on the Net Share site. You can find that link in the chat. Um, and please sign up for the limited capacity post-workshop Q&A session for next week. And um, if you have a few minutes to please respond to the feedback survey as well. Thank you so much. And please um, always remember to register for the rest of the series as well. <laughs>